Hello and welcome everyone to our workshop as part of the Designing for Empathy Summit and Workshop Series. We are delighted to have you joining us on what is a drizzly rainy day here in New York City. But we also have our colleagues from really all over the country joining us uh, today and participants from all over the world. So wherever you are in the world, welcome. My name is Greg Stevens, and I will be your moderator for this workshop. I am delighted to have this be the second year of moderating the Designing for Empathy Summit and Workshops alongside my colleague and friend, Elif Goxigdem, whom I will introduce in just a moment. But before I do so, a couple of housekeeping slides or housekeeping points for you all. First, uh, know that we are recording this session for future use, so you all will be able to have access to this program after the summit concludes. And you will also notice live transcription, closed captioning that I've enabled for anybody who needs that service. And lastly, before I turn it over to Alif, I do want to provide a couple of important land, acknowledge land acknowledgements. I happen to be here in New York City, which is located in the ancestral Lenape lands. And as such, we recognize the significance of these lands for Lenape nations past and present. And Alif, I know that you are in Washington, DC, which resides on the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Anacostan peoples, including the Piscataway and Pomunque peoples. Um, and I know our colleagues from the Seattle Aquarium will offer a land acknowledgement shortly. But before uh, we do that, we just want to collectively acknowledge the traditional native, native inhabitants of all these places and uplift their historic, unique, and enduring relationship with the land. So with that said, Elif, thank you so much for being here and I turn it over to you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here and facilitating the workshop. And uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining us for this um, uh, design challenge. Uh, and before we start, I would like to just uh, provide uh, all with a quick background about what is designing for empathy uh, and uh, why are we doing this? Uh, and then uh, I think they, they can help us uh, uh, bring some context to um, our gathering today. So our main goal with the Designing for Empathy uh, framework, which includes you know, workshops and summits, is to create a platform where individuals from different backgrounds, disciplines, and sectors can come together to develop solutions to the empathy deficit in our world. We believe that our ability to develop individuals' capacity for empathy towards the oneness of all beings, all of humanity, the environment, and the planet lies at the heart of our ability to solve our most complex problems. The challenges we face today from social injustice to climate change are not because we lack the intellectual capacity, the technologies or the resources to tackle them, but they are because caring for others as much as we care for ourselves as if that other could also be me, requires a major perspective shift. This is where we stop seeing ourselves as the centers of the universe and start recognizing that we are all interconnected parts of something much greater than ourselves. This pragmatic perspective shift from I to all can only be achieved through an experience. Uh, and empathy, our ability to imagine the world through another's perspective provides the foundation. We believe that because empathy can be best learned through lived experiences, creating those authentic experiences where individuals can discover, unlock and advance their potential for empathy in safe and non-judgmental spaces become more essential. Uh, one, organization of networks for empathy and designing for empathy framework with its workshops and the summits uh, are here to provide a platform to a diverse group of individuals to come together and experiment with the creation of these perspective shifting experiences that lead to a spark of empathy on a journey towards the realization of the oneness of all beings. With that, uh, I would like to welcome again, everyone, the, the Seattle Aquarium colleagues. And uh, I also would like to acknowledge uh, your you know, support for the summit as, as all the past summits, uh, really, really grateful uh, for your contributions in so many different ways. 
uh, with that, uh, I'm just going to invite you know uh, Jim to uh, perhaps start introducing the the team and uh, take it over from there. Thank you. Thank you, Elif. So happy to be here, and thank you for providing this incredible platform, uh, not just for us to take advantage of, but for everybody to come together and and uh, and learn how we can build more empathy together. Now, allow me to share my screen here. So welcome everyone to the workshop. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. I am Jim Wharton. My pronouns are he and him. I'm the Director of Conservation Engagement and Learning at the Seattle Aquarium. The Seattle Aquarium stands quite literally knees deep in the Salish Sea and the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people. We've learned a lot about our relationship with the sea from our Coast Salish partners. And though they might not use the term, the, their view of nature is steeped in empathy. Now, I'm really pleased to be with you here today and happy to have our colleagues with us to, to help facilitate this workshop. Dave and Sarah. Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Glenn. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and it's really a pleasure to have you join us today. Thanks uh, for being here. I am the manager of volunteer engagement at the Seattle Aquarium and the project lead for what we're talking about today. I look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. Hi, I'm Sarah Brinkert, and my pronouns are she and her, and I am the principal evaluator at the Seattle Aquarium. So I have the delightful job of trying to understand what happens because people visit a space and have experiences um, in a place like the aquarium. And I'm involved in the project um, because I'm super curious about, about this work. And also I have a background in um, exhibit development and evaluation from children's museums and other spaces um, way back. So so thank you so much for joining us today. Now, I see many familiar faces on our participant list, but if you would, and if you haven't already, could you please drop your name and affiliation in the chat? I think that'll help everybody get to know each other a little bit better. So three years ago, and I can't believe it's been quite, I can't believe it's only been three years. It feels like a lifetime since then. There was a group of museum professionals and a dude from an aquarium uh, who sat in this sacred space after spending three days together. And we all wondered aloud how we were going to take what we had learned from not just the Dalai Lama, His Holiness, but also from each other and kind of enlarge it to our colleagues in our community. So we made commitments. Uh, we made commitments to each other to pay our learning forward. One of my commitments was to bring this community, which has grown just a little bit. So my tardiness actually has really paid off for us. Uh, we wanted to bring this community into this design process for what we envisioned as a, a quote unquote transformative mobile empathy conservation experience. Now I'm finally delivering on that commitment today and I'm super excited to see how all of you can help us transform our vision with your own professional and life experiences. Because we, we know what zoos and aquariums have done in the past with mobile experiences and we know that that's not good enough. We need to think differently. So it is absolutely true that we are an animal-centric facility full of animal-loving people concerned about animal and habitat conservation. And at the same time, it's also true that conservation is not really an animal or a habitat problem. It's a people problem. So when you think about it that way, you realize that we aren't really an animal-serving institution. We're a people-serving institution. People, in our case, are simultaneously the problem, the solution, and the beneficiaries. And that's because ocean health and animal health and human health are the same. Some of our colleagues have embraced this idea, this kind of inextricable interconnectedness as the one health paradigm. And it fits so well with, with, with what Elif and others at the summits over the years have, have thought about and embraced this idea of, of thinking about us as one community, both people, and animals and habitats and ecosystems. And that's where we believe empathy comes in as a tool to help people connect or to reconnect with nature. But reconnect uh, isn't quite right because it's not like, it, it's more like we wanna reawaken people's connection. People are connected to nature whether they realize it or not. Humans are natural beings. 
we didn't become unnatural when we started developing technology or building things. We may feel separate sometimes, or people may feel separate, but it's all an illusion. And it's one that we've created ourselves. So maybe empathy's job is to kind of clean the cobwebs from our vision and help people see and embrace that connectedness. And that's the kind of experience we want to create with your help, of course. But before we get too far along, I want to share our definition of empathy. Everybody has their own idea of empathy, and there are literally hundreds of definitions in the academic literature. We've chosen to work from this definition, empathy as a stimulated emotional state that relies on the ability to perceive, understand, and care about the experiences and perspectives of another person or animal. And we feel it's important to establish that empathy is a skill or ability that people can practice and improve upon. Some people may be more naturally empathetic in the same way that some people are more naturally artistic or athletic, but anyone can become more empathetic with practice. We also want to expand the idea of empathy from just emotions to this idea of perspectives, because many living things don't have anything like emotions, but they do have a perspective of the world, predictable reactions to stimuli that we can understand and appreciate. Starfish may grip rocks tight in response to shadows, flowers turn towards the light, predictable experiences and perspectives that we can appreciate. Tricky thing about empathy and what leads to kind of arguments and confusion is that there isn't one kind of empathy. As it turns out, empathy is a bit of an umbrella term that can that sort of encompasses many different related concepts, affective, cognitive, motivational, and positive empathy. And while I know that many of you are, are quite familiar with empathy generally and empathy specifically, maybe academically as well, we wanted to go through these again, just from our perspective so that you understood the, where we were coming from and we'd all be on the same page. Now, affective empathy is a state of shared emotions. So this kind of empathy is very meaningful and very powerful between people, but may be confusing or misleading when we think about having affective empathy between animals and people, non-human animals and people. Cognitive empathy just means that I understand your feelings or perspectives, even if I don't share or experience them myself. I may understand that a little girl dropping her ice cream would feel sad, even though I may not have any personal feelings about the incident. A motivational and positive empathy are about what we do with our affective and cognitive empathy. They're about how we respond. If we see a loved one crying, we may feel motivated to comfort them, to show them compassion. If we see a child laughing and joyful, we may feel a desire to extend their happiness or their well being. Let me stop the share here for a second. Now, when we say we wanna create a transformative empathy experience between animals and people, what we mean is we want them to experience a degree of cognitive empathy and respond by taking some kind of action. So the Colorectal Cancer Society of America has an outreach tool that I would call a transformative empathy experience. Um, it's a giant inflatable colon. Uh, this giant inflatable colon comes in mini, medium, and giant sizes, as you would expect. Uh, people can take a tour of the colon with a guide. They enter one side of the colon having no interest or, or thought about colorectal cancer. cancer. They come out on the other side with a, sort of a desire and willingness to take some kind of action. Uh, these are very, very effective outreach tools. And what we want to do is we want to create the giant inflatable colon of ocean conservation. And we want to do it together with you today. And Dave is going to explain how we're going to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. That's a, that's a hard act to follow. Um, so so what is the aquarium hoping for out of today's design session? Um, well, let's first talk about what we're not looking for. We are not looking for a completed, fully fleshed out design with blueprints and operating instructions. So if we can accomplish that in two hours and some change, I think we deserve a medal. Um, rather today we are looking for 
an iterative, interactive experience for all of us that generates some themes and big ideas for us to ultimately center our design around and create a compelling transformative experience for our visitors. We imagine that ideas from today's charrettes and future design sessions will interact with one another as we seek to settle on a concept that's truly transformative. In addition, we've discovered that these charrettes um, give us little moments or scenes within the outreach experience that may nestle in really nicely to the big ideas uh, that we generate. These might include things like porthole windows, the sound of an invertebrate's beating heart. These are touching, empathy-inspiring moments that might be further developed as we design our outreach experience. So today we're really looking for an idea explosion um, for which we'll find those big ideas, the themes and little moments that will help us in our journey as we create an outreach experience that helps people reflect on their connection with wildlife and moves people towards action to care for wildlife. It's important to note that we are purposely bringing together folks from somewhat disparate fields. Our hope is that folks uh, from these different fields will, will bring um, uh, their own thinking and ideas to the outreach experience. We don't presume that you have expertise in marine life or in outreach, but we are confident that you have your own expertise and lived experience that will contribute to a really robust conversation today. Now, any good design challenge has a design briefing or some parameters for the design. And so we'll start with our goal. Our ultimate goal is to design a mobile exhibit that would bring increased awareness of marine life to the community and help people care about the experience and perspectives of those animals in a way that will inspire them to take conservation action for the marine environment. And so our intended outcomes for the, the mobile exhibit include that people will demonstrate increased empathy for animals and people will express an intention to take conservation action after visiting the exhibit. Now, some of those design parameters. First and foremost, we intend to be a traveling outreach experience. That means the exhibit must be mobile. It might be in a neighborhood one day and at a school for a program the next. What mobile means is up to you as designers. Perhaps the outreach experience is built into a vehicle or perhaps it's an inflatable exhibit that travels in a truck. We're quite open to creative solutions around how the outreach experience travels. The outreach experience may or may not include live animals. If it does include live animals, we'll only include those animals whose life history would be conducive to safe travel. And we, we can ensure that their animal welfare needs are met. So that likely means things like invertebrates, perhaps sea stars or anemones. Uh, we do not intend to create a traveling sea otter exhibit. That said, we do encourage you to think about uh, beyond live animals as part of the exhibit. What could we design that might not include an interaction with an animal, but would still develop a really strong connection with marine life? We do imagine this as a facilitated experience rather than a static, unhosted exhibit. That means staff and volunteers will be present and available to guide visitors through the exhibit or experience. Staff and volunteers might not be there for the whole experience, but perhaps might have moments within those experiences. Finally, our audience. We imagine that this is a mobile experience for our broad community. We imagine folks coming in mixed age groups and with their own level of prior knowledge and varied experiences uh, with nature. People will come as they are and don't necessarily come from with an expectation or motivation to learn. We do not anticipate that we'll be able to control how long people will dwell at the experience. It could be two minutes or it could be much longer. As we design, we might consider how people are drawn in and hooked to, to uh, visit the exhibit. Also vital is an experience that is accessible to all, including all of us with our varied physical, social, and cognitive abilities. Now that we have our design briefing, and I will put some of those bullet points in the chat for you, uh, I'm going to throw it over to Sarah for a little bit of a warm, warm up. Sarah, take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dave. So as Dave mentioned, our hope today is to be playfully generative, um, to expand and to diverge, and to really widen our thinking about what's possible. 
So we'd like to start with an exercise to get our synapses firing and get us in this space. It has two functions. One is to warm us up for some rapid fire, low risk idea generation. And the second purpose is to start getting all of our voices together into this space. Because as Dave and Jim both mentioned, we are so honored that you, with your lived experience and your creativity and your point of view, have come to be with us um, in this playful idea generation space today. So we're going to play uh, sort of a free association word game. And here's how it's going to work. In just a moment, I'm going to share my screen. And on that screen, you'll see some instructions for accessing the platform Poll Everywhere. And it'll have a special code with my name um, that'll take you to our activity. And you'll have two options. You can either choose to join Poll Everywhere through a browser window. Um, or via text if you'd like to do it on a mobile device or if you've got a phone handy. Um, I know I'm working from one screen, so I've got like phones and a whole kind of setup going on. So um, two caveats. If for any reason you have trouble accessing the Poll Everywhere platform, the chat is a great option. We'll invite you to pop your ideas in there. And yeah, so let's do that. I'm going to share my screen and we'll kick this off. All right, so this should be coming up for us. Fantastic, can you maybe give me a thumbs up or just unmute and, and give me a hey if you see um, a screen that says how to join. Not yet. Sarah, I see a partial screen. The, the, the screen you're sharing is only sharing like, seems like just a portion, like the right side. There, you can see it now. Got it. Thanks, Ayla. Thanks, Jim. Perfect. All right. So this first screen has the directions for how to join on the web. The website is poll, ev, no space, dot com. And then our activity code is my first and last name, no spaces, and then the number 699. So if you're able to jump on a browser and enter that in, it'll take you to poll everywhere. Alternatively, there's an option to text. You can text that same code, Sarah Brankert 699 to this number, and then you'll be able to text your responses. So we're gonna be playing a word association game. You'll see a word, or in this case, a pair of words that pop up on your screen. And we'd love for you to add a word that comes to mind. So you should see a text box where you have the option to type in a response and we'll be making word clouds. If for any reason you want to use more than one word, we encourage you to put a underscore, a dash, or a tilde between them. Oh, excellent. Perfect. I see that folks are getting in. You may absolutely enter more than one response. So bring it. Keep them coming. We'll let these populate for just a minute and see our word cloud start to grow. Excellent. So in true word cloud fashion, um, if a word or an idea gets multiple entries, the size changes relative to the number of entries that it has. Excellent. Diverse, peregrination, mysterious, gills, awe-inspiring, fantastic. All right, let's jump to the next one. Same idea, word association. Give us some associations. What comes to mind for you when you hear or see or imagine invertebrate? Spineless, squishy. Yeah, so kind of a tactile sensation. Underappreciated. Yes, I see. Oh, oh, a sack. That's a sack and squishy. Fantastic. Right, I see some examples of some of these invertebrates. Oh, terrific, quiet. An interesting descriptor, the idea of an invertebrate is quiet. Ooh, goo, unknown, kind of a mystery. Oh, fantastic. All right, next one. Underwater, what is your association? What comes to mind 
underwater, dark and deep. Oh, beautiful. So deep is a recurring idea. Yeah, all oh, peaceful, quiet, and magical. Yes, mysterious, that element of the unknown. Alien, yeah, unexplored, serenity, beautiful. All right, oceanic. Vast, so this expansiveness, huge, salty. I love that we're seeing salty in multiple contexts. Um, it's not often that we can incorporate a sense of taste into an exhibit, but this is really, this is really intriguing. Massive, oh, waves. Yeah, I see folks mentioning this idea of the, of the, of the surf, of the waves, of the movement. Beautiful. All right, let's get another one. How about marine animals? When you think about a marine animal, what pops to mind? There they are, the otters. Yes. Ah, food, interesting. And different ideas about food, right? Food for humans, food for other creatures. Zooplankton. The idea of an ecosystem, some interconnectedness. Protection, plankton, so interesting. Some of those unsung uh, zooplankton, plankton, wonderful. All right, a little bit of a different word. What connects to home? Safety and comfort. Hmm. Distance, for some of us, home is far. So safety and security, like goes. Belonging. Oh, I love the word exhaling. That notion of, I don't know if that's what you meant, but that's what, what that brought to mind for me. Personal, warm, ours, shared. Wow, great. All right. A different direction yet again. Submerged. Wait a second, now we don't like this. Ooh, yeah, a little scary. Yeah, fearful. There's threat, there's danger. Beneath, the sensation of being under or below. Mm, oneness, so like immersion. Ooh, maybe a little bit of a tension between exciting and frightening. A sense of being surrounded. Ooh, a submarine. Interesting. Airless. Yeah. All right, just a couple more, and then we'll we'll roll into our next, we'll tie this to our next experience. Connected community, people. Gaia. This notion of an interconnected planet. Oh, a sense of wholeness. Belonging appears again here. It's interesting. Mm, tricky. Being seen. It's an interesting idea that this might, this exhibit might not just be about seeing others, but, but feeling seen yourself. Beautiful. All right. One more. Going to invite you. So hopefully you are seeing an image of um, an animal in the water. And what comes to mind in reaction to this image? Oh, friends. <laughs> Sorry. Num num num. Pom poms. Chain. Feeding lunch. Prickly. Mm. <laughs> Mustache playing the backstroke. <laughs> oh, I love that. This idea of like different swimming strokes, like moving in those different ways. It's fantastic. So fuzzy. Thank you for someone who took the time and effort to put the dash so that we would get so fuzzy together. 
Beautiful. Awesome. Thank you so much for participating in that um, little exercise in association. And I think it's really, um, really fascinating. Some of the divergence, both some of the alignment and sort of convergence, but also some of the places where we saw some really um, innovative and ingenious connections. So thanks for that. And in particular, that last image, I love that you noticed both the, that all of the animals in the picture, we had both the otter and the sea urchins and some speculation about the different relationships that might, the, that might be going on with those creatures. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to Jim and we're gonna talk a little bit about, for example, those animals that you just saw in that image, why it might be easier to empathize with some creatures than others. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So we're going to talk about a few more ideas before we really dive into our design exercise. And when you, you look at animals like sea otters and urchins, you can begin to see patterns in the characteristics that typically engender empathy for animals and people. So people seem, feel, seem to feel more capable of empathizing with animals that show agency, affectivity, coherence, and continuity. Now, agency just means that an animal takes an action to meet its needs. So it eats or it grooms or it plays. People recognize this and they relate to it. I do those sorts of things. Now, affectivity in people would be like facial expressions or body language. And that, that works for some animals. But by and large, people misattribute activity for affectivity. So active animals are happy and healthy. Sedentary animals are sad and depressed. That's wrong, but it's what people do. Now, coherence just means that an animal looks like an animal. It has arms, legs, and a face. You may never have seen a pangolin before in your life, but when you're presented with a pangolin, you immediately accept that it's an animal. An anemone is another story. It looks as much like a flower as it does an animal. And in fact, it's named for a flower. Now, finally, continuity is just the time that we spend with animals. And this is why we're sure we know exactly what our pets are thinking. Now, when you look at, sorry, I'm having a little uh, slide issue. There we go. I wanted you to see these two together. When you look at something like an otter, you see these characteristics on full display, but we can also use these characteristics strategically when we use animals that are sort of less obvious. So for example, both the animals pictured here have arms and a mouth. Uh, you know where they are in an otter, on an anemone, these are their arms in a ring around the mouth in their center. If you touch their arms gently, those sticky arms quickly wrap around your finger because they're trying to sting you either as either for protection or because they might think that you're food. In just a few strokes, you can establish that the anemone has agency, affectivity, and a degree of coherence. So we believe that these characteristics and their ability to spark empathy in people's minds will be key in any experiential empathy design. And I'll, I'll stop sharing and turn it over to Sarah for us to roll up our sleeves and, and start generating some ideas. Yeah, the time has come for us to jump in. So we are gonna launch our first sort of design iteration session. And for this exercise, um, we are going to move you in to some breakout rooms and you'll be in a group probably between three and five. I think we've got about four folks on average in each of the rooms. And you will have about 10 minutes. So a pretty quick design session. It'll be important that one of the folks in your breakout room is willing to be the scribe, drawer, sketcher, recorder, because when we come back together, we're gonna to invite each of the rooms to share out and maybe do a kind of a low tech uh, screen share with any drawings or artifacts or sketches that have come forward from your work. Additionally, it'll be important for that scribe recorder to remember who they are because we'll actually be uh, coming back to them in the second 
uh, uh, design challenge that we have. So let's jump in. In your small group, you are going to be challenged to start designing, start drawing, start imagining some kind of mobile empathy, marine wildlife, ocean conservation experience, and all the design parameters that Dave mentioned earlier, and I know he popped a couple of those um, bullets into the chat, but we would like you to draw inspiration from, share my screen, We would like you to draw inspiration from some beloved vehicles. So you will be assigned to a breakout room that has one of these vehicles as its organizing theme, as its name. So you might be in the group that is to take design inspiration from an ice cream truck. You might be in a group finding inspiration in some element of a good old yellow school bus. Perhaps it's a food truck that will give your group a jumping off point. Maybe it's a tuk tuk or beloved bookmobile. Um, I realize not everyone maybe holds bookmobiles as close to their heart, but it was a huge part of my growing up. I lived in a place where there wasn't a library close by and the bookmobile was a, an absolute a huge part of my childhood. Maybe it's a trolley. Maybe your group uh, will be inspired by a parade float or a pedicab. So you will be assigned to a room that is named after one of these vehicles. In addition to that, you will have the vehicle inspiration and you can choose to riff on any part of it, right? Maybe it's something about its function. Maybe it's something about its look or one of its features or characteristics, or maybe it's a kind of an ephemeral association that you have. The only uh, jumping off point is that it's in some way for your group related to your inspiration vehicle. The second quality or uh, parameter for your design is to incorporate one of those characteristics that Jim talked about a moment ago. So something about your design should be intended to highlight or to elevate agency, affectivity, or coherence. And we'll pop um, a little bit of a cheat sheet, um, a link to a PDF in the chat, if your group wants to refresh your mind a little bit about exactly what we mean by agency, affectivity, or coherence. You can choose more than one if you wish, but we're requiring your design to think about a vehicle for inspiration and one of the characteristics that help to inspire empathy. So before we move you to your breakout rooms, what questions or clarifications might be helpful? Whether it's any of my co-presenters or anyone who was listening to the instructions just now, what can, what, how can we support you as we get ready to move into these rooms? I, I know many of us might be a little afraid of drawing or, or sketching in front of others. Um, these charrettes are intended to be, to be quick designs that are not pieces of art that we'll hang on a, a, in a gallery wall. So please, please do make quick, quick sketches, no judgment on our part um, for how those turn out. But I might put them on my refrigerator, so no promises. We might turn them into a mug. No, just kidding. All right, fantastic. We cannot wait to see what you come up with. So Megan, I think we are ready to move to breakout rooms. Thanks so much. And then number four. So I did not assign any of you to a room. I don't know if you are able right. to jump in from where you are, if I need to assign you in order to get in there. Nope, we can do, we can uh, hit any of them if we want. Okay, great. 
Thank so you, good. Brandon. Good start. Maybe it was content heavy, but um, I'm, I'm excited to see how, how people get along in this. Oh my gosh, I wanted to say to you as an educator and as a museum educator and teaching an exhibition class right now, this was brilliant. Oh, just, thank you. I mean, truly, I mean, all of you are just lovely um, in terms of your communication approach and clarity of, of intent and the activity, the, the, the word cloud thing, fabulous. Um, yeah, really, really nice. So I'm personally really impressed. So thank you. Thank you, Greg. That's very Thank nice you. of you to say. Oh, thanks, Greg. That's I'm like, no, seriously, I'm like, I'm totally stealing this Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of our, we were talking about what, what we hope folks get out of this. And one of the things was maybe they use design sessions like this in their own, in their own work. So we got one, guys. We got one. Cool. Nice work. <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, what's so interesting. I, you know, I head up a graduate program in museum professions and this particular course, exhibition course, the students are so intent on um, delivering the content, right? So, I mean, I'm sure you know this. They, they want to do the content, but they don't want to think about the experience and the, the storytelling and the emotional connection that you all are talking about. Um, yeah, so I just think it's really, this is, and what an easy thing for people to do. You got people engaged with the, like the word cloud thing. I know you've done this before, but you got a room full of people who are engaged in something to getting them warmed up and just really, really nice. So I'm totally stealing it. Good. <laughs> you are welcome to it. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. All right. I'm gonna Float around a little Oh, shoot. So I'm hearing from a couple folks that um, it was a short amount of time that people barely had a chance to kind of chat and get to know each other. So totally okay. We will expect very preliminary, pretty raw um, sketches or ideas, and that is 100% okay. And we'll actually be revisiting um, this design challenge again in just a few minutes. So if your group had a chance to start playing with some ideas or to get anything, um, any shapes or um, sketches down on paper, we would love to hear a little bit about what came up for you. Like, what did you find delightful or intriguing or fun to play with? And Kevin, I think I saw you. Were you the scribe for your group? Yeah, do you wanna kick us off? Yeah, we had an awesome group. Most everyone's name started with M except mine, which was awesome. <laughs> our, our group was Team Vegan Ice Cream Truck. Oh, let me turn this light off. Uh, so we were Vegan Ice Cream Truck. I, we took the liberty of adding vegan. Um, and so what, what inspired the group, which was really great, was the idea of the coldness around what ice cream gives us, that sense of cold. And then maybe if we can bring an experience for uh, animals that live in a colder environment, and marine animals that live in colder waters or in Arctic areas. And how do we bring that experience into play? Because it, and then the idea of an ice cream truck is a multi-sensory experience. The first you hear that music and the audio, and then you come in, you see the visual of the colors of the ice cream truck and the menu and you get excited. And then you, you have the smells of the ice cream and the conversation and the 
And then you have the feel, the taste of the ice cream as you're holding it and eating it and that the joy it brings you. So our group, we were thinking about what if we created a multi-sensory experience that people individually sort of go through in, into this. So something like, so, um, so some rudimentary, um, th these are like sections or curtains or whatever that you walk through. You starting from the left is first you hear the ice cream truck sound almost, and then you compare it to the sounds you might hear in the water when maybe they're going to feed, when they're about, when those animals are about to start their, their sort of daily or whatever they're trying to eat or whatever that's some activity that they're doing and what sounds that might be heard. And then there's the sort of prompts or in there, but first is just that experience. And you, and then you're invited to immerse yourself and just let yourself be in that experience. And the idea is go through it individually. So you don't feel that people are watching and being immersed. Like you're just going through this. So you, it becomes your experience in that mo moment. Um, and, and please, anyone on my team, please unmute and, and, and interrupt and share as well. Um, then the next one was more visual. With ice cream, we're drawn to objects. What are these animals drawn to? What are some things? And then maybe they can see those objects in there and be felt like, okay, if you were drawn to it, what were you thinking? What are you feeling? What, why would you be drawn to those things? The next um, is uh, the sense of feeling, like maybe touching those objects or that is, what is that surrounding feel like? Um, Throughout, we can have this so almost like a briny smell, the smell of salty, something just like throughout that experience. And then the next is something around taste. What are the things that might come into play when these animals taste? And maybe it's something you try and just to feel that. And the end, the last one you come out is this majestic like room that's covered, like, or like the space that has screens or one screen. So as if you're immersed into this space and all these senses have come together now and you are invited to be that animal, to jump in and, and play. And then at the end, I, um, I think Mark or something, I had an idea of like, you come out and then uh, we, like, you have a guest book and you sign the guest book as one of the, like the animal you chose or that vision you chose. And then you get an ice cream that's part of that experience as well. And, and so that takes you through the experience and it's memorable because the ice cream is memorable. You have a guest book, you could even take a picture of that and post it on your social media or something and that becomes that experience. So that was the idea. I love oh, that you became an animal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that had that that perspective taking moment. That's that's amazing. Yeah, and so multi-sensory and I like all of those connections like really really great. And I love how um, how much inspiration you were able to find in the the sort of the trope of an ice cream truck but for this completely novel sort of purpose and it and it so it fits beautifully. Anybody from your team want to add anything or I know Kevin did a great job explaining it. I thanks for doing that. Fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing. So is there another group that would be willing to tell us a little bit about your process and conversation? Maybe if you were able to talk about your inspiration vehicle, what what can what you connected with there or which of the characteristics maybe you thought about in your design, your preliminary design? I think I see Kathy Yoon's hand. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so I drew it on iPad. Ooh, it's a little glary. Okay, so we had a school, there we go. We had a school bus. Um, and so we like kind of thought about, I'm gonna step my face back, where you um, thought about the idea of like a magic school bus. Um, and I see that it's mirrored, which is unfortunate, but, um, we thought about the magic school bus being a sensory immersion situation where it's like you walk in and it smells like the salt of the sea and it, you know, the lighting can change depending on like the time of day and you feel the like ripples of sunlight through the water and the, what's the last word? Oh, the sounds of the beach and things like that. And then once you get in there, the kids or audiences are engaged in the design challenge of their own, where they're asked to create a sea creature that would live in this environment, right? So, um, you know, you're touching the rocks and feeling the sand. You're like, okay, so what kinds of legs would this sea creature need? What kinds of, you know, how would it see? Like, what would it use to eat? What would it, who would it live with? Um, and so you have this kind of, this design challenge that kids are going through or people are going through. 
Um, and then at the end, they get to name their animal and then you capture all the different animals that people have made and put them up so you can see in one community space all the different creatures that um, the community members have created. And then you can also link that to the real animals like, oh, this really reminds me of a Dumbo octopus. Like, and then they get to take away something that um, links to a, a real creature in the sea. We also talked about if that experience was too intense or, or whatever, you could also flex to be like a day in the life of experience. So same innards, but you hand the participants a card as they go in and they get to be a sea urchin or they get to be a otter or whatever um, and experience all the different parts of the, uh, the beach as that animal. Yes. Um, and of course, in this scenario, the school bus is gutted of all of the seats and it's, it's the shell. Okay. Team. You, you captured it all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely a theme there. Both, both groups really leaned into the sensory immersion and the imaginative nature. And you're, you're kind of calling forward some, some last little bit of a, uh, the last few ideas we're going to share because there are definitely things that seem to draw us towards empathy. Those are great ideas. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Anyone, how about the other groups? Yeah, lead away. Is that, yeah. Yeah, I have a few words, but I think, Alex, that you've been writing much more than I did. But let's, let's give it a try together, right? Shall we do that? Yeah, and Catherine, jump in, eh? <laughs> Catherine said, who's been scribing? <laughs> so we are in a pedicab. And so we thought, let's bring the pedicab. First, we had to define what a pedicab was, because in South Africa, Catherine and me in France, we don't have pedicabs. But we thought, ah, it's a rickshaw, right? But then one on a bicycle. So we thought, oh, that's an interesting concept to live in. How about you get somebody into the pedicab? It needs to be mobile, so let's get it mobile. You get somebody into the pedicab and you get the facilitator who is doing the driving. It's also a nice sporty exercise for the facilitators who's doing the driving. And you give the person in the pedicab um, virtual reality goggles. And in that virtual reality, while they are moving, you're taking them through the ocean. So that was the basic idea that we had. Um, and then we get, got into, you know, when you dive, Catherine was talking about free diving in the ocean where she lives, how it's a solo experience very often, right? And especially also when you have these diving um, um, glasses on, right? you get a very limited perspective through those glasses. So you constantly need to move to see different things. And so same for virtual reality glasses, except that they can really open things up. So that's one thing we were still considering. And also the relationship of the, the facilitator who's peddling um, with the person who is going through the experience and whether the facilitator could be a storyteller in that hole, or it could be somebody who's asking questions, pointing you out to see different things within the virtual reality. I think that's all I have for now. Anything to add? I think there were a couple of um, interesting things that also came up when when I was thinking about when we were thinking about the sort of rickshaw or the pedicab is is that it's sort of like person powered. And this idea of like person powered centralized into a more like connected, like part of something much, much larger. And so we sort of went back and forth. Um, one of the about whether it's like a communal experience or whether it's an individual experience and and um, whether it's about the person connecting with something much larger, a la sort of one health model, like being part of something bigger and really looking at the 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 motion and just you know feeling the motion of the ocean and connecting with it that way um there was something that that uh it, with the entire experience that Catherine had said that i wrote down verbatim where she said it's like when when you're free diving it's really just about becoming aware of the ocean and i i loved that and it was like that seems like like so we didn't even get to like the animals it didn't get to the plants it's just 
you know, becoming, you know, becoming aware of something that's much larger than yourself. I love that. I did again, that kind of really truly immersive and the, like it's, there's so many things that call, call back for us. Right. And we know that smell is really linked with memory, but so is motion, right? Like the, the feel of being on a boat is, is something that, that recalls you to those moments so quickly. So I, I love that idea of the addition of motion. Can I? Oh, oh go ahead, Dave. Kate, I, was Kate, I see Kate's hand. Yeah, Kate, go ahead. Oh, Kate, I think you're still muted. How did I do that? Um, we got so excited about um, meeting each other that we were a little slow to do it. And my, my thing is horrible, but it didn't matter because of time because I wouldn't be very good spatially anyway. But we did do a speed thing at the end. We ended up focused on otters. Um, and since we had a food truck, talked about having all over the truck foods that otters eat. And then also all over interpretation as well about keepers and what they are providing the otters and the decisions they're making. I, I don't know whether otters was what we were supposed to, but that's what we did. And the decisions they're making in terms of provisioning and choices about food and probably whether it has to do with things like behavioral. And then not live animals, but stuff, not stuffed, uh, plushy otters. And then also very much the fact that since often people can't go into a food truck, that the entry into the food truck being allowed to go in and have that firsthand experience, kind of getting into the kitchen is an important part of it. And if I could just add one other thing that keeps rattling in my brain, yeah. which is the article I edited in uh, Labor's Heritage Journal uh, about in the 1950s, shoe and clothing trucks going to people in West Virginia coal communities. And one of the key things about these trucks is people didn't have stores for this stuff. It was a completely uh, separate experience. It was the way that shoes and clothing entered these communities to a large extent, these very mm -hmm. tiny communities. And I think the perspective of maybe the, these kind of trucks, they're not just a dime a dozen, even if it is a food truck that we were assigned, but a truck that is bringing something that normally is not entering that community and the mobileness of bringing that in could be a theme to work with. Yeah, right. Yeah, there, yeah, there are limitations. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, thanks, Kate, for explaining all that. Um, I was in, Kate and I were in the same group with Rahena. And um, just, to, just to add on, um, we also talked about there being on the side of the food truck, like using that as the, um, you know, the, the theme or whatever, that there could be a menu of the foods that otters eat. Um, and then I was just thinking before, someone spurred me on to think, well, what if empathy, maybe one of the foods that they could eat on this menu would actually be, um, I'm thinking of sea turtles now in plastic bags. I'm not sure what the bad food, the unrecycled food would be for otters but whatever that is to kind of bring people an awareness that you know otters can be damaged by what's going on in the sea as well by humans um so anyway we had a great time with the food truck it's amazing what can, what can happen with these un, unusual um ideas so thank you ah no thank you all and exactly what you and kate were both saying right that there are, there are limitations built into this notion of a mobile experience, and there are extraordinary affordances of this traveling, this ability to, to kind of cross thresholds or cross into spaces and, and bring something novel, something, um, you know, sometimes in, in, we talk about like a threshold experience of crossing over into something new um, and being able to be kind of transported into that different world. And, and I love the idea of, of sort of sharing a meal with an animal in some, in some way, shape or form. Awesome, great. So I think that's all four of our uh, brainstorming groups. So Jim, let's talk, some of these came up in the group. So let's talk a little bit about the, about the. Yeah, so we, we wanted to give you one last little, uh little set of ideas and then dive back in and see what those might inspire for another round of design. So uh, when we went into uh, our original literature review and our expert consultation, we drew out these six uh, effective practices for engendering empathy for animals. And we believe that, that, any, that activating these practices will also be key to an effective experiential design. And these practices are framing, experience, modeling, practice, 
imagination, and knowledge. And so very briefly, uh, framing is just about how you present an animal experience, uh, what you can do to help people see the animal as, or any animal really, as a subjective other, rather than just a specimen or like a science object. So using pronouns like he, she, or they instead of it, uh, using an animal's name or giving an animal a name, uh, or focusing on an animal's senses or perspective, all of these things can help in that regard. And of course, many of you have already clued into this, but rich sensory experiences are super important. If you can see what an animal sees or smell what an animal smells, maybe even taste what an animal tastes, it's much easier to, to believe that you can take their perspective. Modeling happens when we see our caregivers acting with empathy. So providing a guide for parents or other caregivers not only influences the children in their care, but it also creates an opportunity for reinforcement and further development at home. So after they leave that mobile experience. Of course, if empathy is a skill, then you only get better with practice. And so can we design experiences that give people an opportunity to show care or, or to train their perspective taking muscles? Like, it, like an empathy gym. And what is, what is perspective taking if not an active imagination? So activating the imagination with children through role play uh, or with adults through storytelling or theater, all of these things help develop the skills that are necessary for effective and accurate empathy. And then finally, much to the re relief of scientists all over the world, learning facts about animals is in fact good empathy practice, primarily because it prevents people or discourages people from just substituting their own human experience for that non-human animal's experience. So six practices, they all work really well together. Uh, they work even better in combination. And we're curious about what these ideas might inspire in another round of design. All right. And so with that, we are excited to invite you back into some ideation space. And here's our premise. So we realized that those that first round was super short and sweet. Here's what we'd like to do. The scribe from each group is going to stay in that room. Now, I, we realized, we identified that um, I think Kevin had to to depart for another commitment. And so from the vegan ice, ice cream truck group, we are wondering if one of you would be willing to step in as sort of the placeholder to hold the, the collective memory of the vegan ice cream design work from the first round. So I think that's Marta or Mark or Melissa. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Fantastic. So thank you. And Melissa, was that you? Sorry. <laughs> um, I think it was Marta. I think it was Marta. Oh, yeah. Great. Thanks, Marta. Okay. <laughs> Melissa's like, no, it was not me. So what's going to happen is if you were a scribe, you'll stay in the room. So Marta, for example, will be the scribe and she'll stay in ice cream truck. We're going to carousel and randomly reassign other folks. So what'll happen is you'll be um, dispersed and recollected with a new cohort and you'll be assigned to a new room. What'll happen there is we'd like to invite you to either continue to amplify and build on some of the ideas of the original design or depart and kind of, you know, take one piece of it and, and tease that thread out. But we'd love for you to be thinking about at least one of the empathy practices that you want to really center in the space. Like, will your design provide lots of opportunities for um, learning or um, framing? Like, is there something that you're going to do? I think about the, um, the pictures, Kathy, you, you know, that you were talking about, about your new imaginary creature. And I'm thinking like a family photo, like gallery wall, and they all have names and birth dates and favorite foods. Um, but yeah, so whatever the practice is, whether it's framing or learning or experience or any of those six, um, think about at least one that you want to kind of bring forward in your experience. So I know there's a lot. If you're, if you're one of the scribes, you should be 
plugged into the exact same room and your job will be to kind of talk with the group and see which pieces they want to keep and what they want to reinvent. Everyone else, you're going to be randomly reassigned. Um, we're going to take a little longer in this one. I think we're going to take about 15 minutes for design and then we'll come back together for a debrief, but it will, it'll go, it'll go swift again. Um, all right. What questions might you have? Jim's burning question is what tune the empathy ice cream sea life truck will play. <laughs> Perfect, okay. All right. So with that, 15 minutes for the breakout rooms this time. And we are going, Megan, you're amazing. She has organized all of the new breakout rooms. I think we're ready to, um, to open those rooms. See you in 15. Wonderful. All right, so we would love to come back to this and hear a little bit more about um, what happened when you spent some more time with these ideas. So um, if you're willing, I know scribes, um, there's been a lot, you've had a lot to carry and a lot of responsibility on this one. Um, but scribes, if, if you're willing to show us any sketches or, or illustrations or um, anything that you produced through the conversation. And then anyone in the group who wants to tell us a little bit about where you took this, is there a group that would, might like to start? Yeah, Catherine? Well, oh, sorry, Catherine, go for it. Well, Lidave is our scribe, but we were just so excited that we, I thought we would want to share. <laughs> so, but I've been writing. We need to take them through an imagination, Catherine. <laughs> So, so we were the pedicab, right? And we were there, we were moving, we had the goggles on in this virtual reality. And the first thing we wondered is, but what's going to be our destination? Like, what will they see when they get out of the pedicab and take the goggles off? And so that got us into, okay, so we're going to combine practice and imagination, which we see anyway as being part of each other really, um, together in the VR. Um, um, and we're gonna work of course with experience. So imagine you're the water and you just start off being the water and you're the ocean, you are flowing around, that's where you start. And so maybe you get instructed to start off that way, saying, well, you're going, going to step into the pedicab, we're gonna get rolling, you're going to become the water in the ocean and we're gonna take you on an adventure. So there you go, you become the water, you see the water, you feel the water, you flow the water, you become part of the ocean. And then we're gonna be an energy transfer through the food chain. So what happens in that water, right? So first we went off on a, on a plastic brand <laughs> and we thought we're going to be a particle of plastic. And so as that particle of plastic, we're going to be swallowed up by the plankton and then we're being that abstraction in the plankton. And then the plankton is going to be eaten by a little fish and will be that obstruction in the little fish and then the little fish by um, a sea whale or whatever, whatever we have in the sea, no smaller one, a smaller one, but a bit bigger than the fish. And then we're gonna end up in the orca. But there with that abstraction all the time. So at some point we got quite depressed and we thought maybe we're not doing this the right way. Maybe we're having a problem here. So we thought, no, let's do it differently. Let's be the plankton that gets eaten by the little fish um, that gets eaten by the next animal that ends up in the in the orca but all along the way we see that plastic that plastic is always part of our environment so we keep doing something with that plastic but we're not just the obstruction we actually trying like we are the water we're trying to become the animal um, I have to take I have to look at my notes <coughs> um, yeah, oh, that, I'm, I'm going well. So, so at the end of that, in the end of that train of thought, we were quite excited and we thought, okay, so what happens when we step out of that pedicab? What's happening then? And we think when you step out of that pedicab and you take your goggles off, you are going to have the knowledge, right? And that happens either through being on a beach, doing a beach cleanup, 
getting all the plastics off the beach and then build together an art installation with the plastics or becoming uh, ending up being driven into a plastic art installation and have some education around there or being in a room full of plastic and to make an art installation together. But we think it's really important to take it then into action. Did I forget anything? Catherine, Paul, please. I think you did a great job. It was just kind of that idea of following from a small scale up to the large scale, you know, going from a molecule or just plankton all the way up to a whale. Um, and then having that action at the end to kind of not to get too depressed by seeing all the plastic. <laughs> well, yeah, that, there's, yeah. I was just saying there's a story there too, right? So you're, you're going on a right. journey and that, that storytelling lends itself to imagination. And, and so I, I love that. We, we also had a, there was a really engrossing conversation we got into the food truck group about, about imbuing not just animals with perspective uh, and empathy, but, you know, wider, like the landscapes and minerals. And, and in your case, what you were talking about, like either water or plastic. And so I think once you, once you let go of, of empathy as only being connected to emotions, then you can, it's easier to sort of expand your idea of having, having a, sharing the perspective, appreciating the perspective of other aspects of the, of the world around you. So I think that's mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. And I love, I love what you were talking about, about how those, those pieces might come together um, and potentially form, like coalesce into something that could be, could be beautiful and inspiring while still kind of having that call to action. And it makes me think of the Wash to Shore um, art and exhibit, which I know Woodland Park has hosted some. And I know Denver, it, we, it, it was really powerful for my family. We saw it multiple times at the Denver Zoo. And it's, it's really these true things of beauty, these sculptures that are completely constructed of found waste um mm. and but it doesn't glorify the waste but it really calls attention to its presence it's a really that's interesting mm. i love that thank you so much petty cab group and super huge props for going from maybe not having maybe a ton of personal experience with petty cab to generating something so compelling that i want to do it now <laughs> wonderful all right have yeah kate since Jim spoke and since my brain cells are losing thoughts to say to you uh, at, by the moment and my notes have nothing in them of visual, um, let me throw in food truck group briefly so that the others in my group can join in. Um, as Jim said, we ended up having a great conversation focused on perspective taking basically and uh, those practices of well, the ones that mention perspective taking are practice and imagination in the list we got. Um, and, and a lot of that perspective taking did have to do with, uh, as he said, the anthropomorphizing question versus why not, the reasons not to worry about that question and the way that we've all gotten, you know, in this kind of sector, gotten past that. And then the multiplicities of, of, uh, of approaches, as Jim said. And I guess just the practical or, you know, a little bit of the, what would this actually look like? We got as far as thinking, okay, food truck, uh, having food in it, it's also food for thought. And I'm gonna let um, Lottie talk about, she, she came up with an idea of, of wheels and, a, and one wheel that has a whole range of those things that I think she can grab and say better than me. And then I thought, in addition to that wheel, so it's food as metaphor, uh, food for thought, but then also another wheel I'd, I'd say that actually is about actual foods, um, the really practical foods that these animals would be eating or these creatures would be eating. Um, so Lottie, I don't know if you're able to uh, add sure. a bit of that. Yeah. Oh, sure. So yeah, so we were talking about, you know, at the center of this kind of wheel with spokes, whatever would be the animal that we're talking about um, in, in kind of in situ, situ with its environment, but in the, the spokes would all come out to perhaps a different perspective, the perhaps the animals itself's perspective, the maybe the ecosystem's perspective about the animal, maybe an indigenous cultural um, person's perspective about the animal, um, you know, maybe a scientist, like a hardcore scientist who studies the animal, you know, maybe a statistician, maybe a politician, um, you know, kind of just to, to round out some of the different perspectives that might be taken about this particular animal or creature.
Love that. The perspectives ofs and the perspectives on those particular animals. Yeah. And that kind of multiplicity all radiating from a single kind of hub. That's, that's really neat. Wonderful. All right, let's see. School bus or? School bus can go. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm happy to show uh, Alex or Melissa that do you want to talk? Or I'm happy to talk, whatever. I just talk a lot. Okay, I'll talk. Um, so uh, we kind of built out. Okay, so I, I think I'm going to start from the end of our conversation. So the end of our conversation was that this experience, we would like to have flexibility within the experience to account for a lot of different ways of learning, a lot of different um, accessibility requirements, etc. So um, we have common themes, but it's like an a la carte situation where you can you can pick and choose and pivot depending on the audiences that you're serving. So when we talked about the animal for a day situation, um, we I can't read backwards. Um, we talked about how the habitat could change depending on the animal that you are living. Um, Alex brought up a cool, we talked a lot about technology and technological magic that could happen in this space. Um, and so Alex talked about um, this technology that exists to put an avatar in a space and have it change the surroundings, um, change what's around you. So putting like a figurine or something down and having it change the light and the sound profile and um, even the smells, if you're using like a diffuser or something, um, really into my smart diffuser. So that's a possibility for, you know, changing up all of the kind of things that are happening in, in your space. Um, then we talked about uh, the idea that, let's see where to go next. Um, we talked a little bit about the windows of the school bus being portals so that when you come and they can even pivot away from the bus so that when you come out, you can like pull, you know, and the windows maybe are the tanks that have animals in them. And so when you come out of the bus, you can pivot the window away from the bus to show off that animal and people can look under and above and around and, you know, all that kind of the 3D perspective. Um, we talked also about how this could be a space wherein people could practice speech etiquette. Um, really interested in this idea right now of zoos and aquariums being spaces for practicing proper behavior towards the environment. So with your sequence, we, we talked about that with both our create your own sea creature and the be a creature for a day situation where um, as you're going through this, this creation or going through this experience, you're also practicing how to be a good steward of the beach or how to be a good visitor to the beach, uh, particularly for those who do not spend a lot of time at the beach. And then lastly, um, we talked about, I had mentioned that I went to the St. Louis Aquarium um, and I, I sent Jim a video of this, but there's a cool um, interactive where a, an interpreter is behind a screen and they can see the audience, but the audience can't see them. But what the audience sees is like a cartoon of an otter or whatever. It was an otter there, but it doesn't have to be. And as you're walking by, the otter can be like, hey, you in the red shirt, come over here and talk to me. And then I sat there for like 45 minutes watching children come and interact with this otter and being like, where, where are you right now? Like, do you have any friends? Like, who do you live with? You know, um, it requires the interpreter to think on their feet, but it's so cool. Um, and we thought about having the interpreter be like in the driver's seat of the bus and having that screen be on the back wall there. So like in any of these activity scenarios, you could have, you know, like a sea urchin or an anemone or an otter or a barnacle, um, kind of guiding people through as the interpreter, but as the animal instead. Team, did yeah, I capture everything? That, that was awesome. I would say the, the one thing, so I mean, I, I picture it, I'm a Disneyland fan, so like Turtle Talk with Crush, the exact mm -hmm. same idea. Um, because it immediately gives something that potentially could be living in the ocean a name, you know, a personality, you know, things that you wouldn't normally attribute. And then we also talked about, you know, is there a way for 
a group that goes through a, you know, a child, somebody else to then be the next thing, you know, to model that for the next group and, you know, sort of using that like community teaching community type thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the idea of them seeing the animal talking, you know, with, with its own thoughts and perspective and then actually getting to be the animal. That's one of the things that we've, you know, you, you love about play acting with the kids, right? Cause they get to step inside the animal and try them out and, and puppets are the same way. You, it sort of forces you to do that perspective taking and the sound like kind of like doing the same thing, but with technology. And I think also I'm just now going off the cuff. Um, you said kids, which made me think like how would adults interact with this space? And mm -hmm. I think having that could it could still be pertinent to adults because that interpreter through the voice of whatever could guide the experience for adults in a different way. Like we're going to do a guided meditation and like I'm, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it still retains the kind of fun of having a non-human there, but um, it can pivot to include um, less play, more rest, more reflection, et cetera. I would totally meditate with a turtle. I was just about to say, doesn't that sound really relaxing? <laughs> <laughs> or a jelly. Like, what would be better than that? Yeah. Jamming with the jellies. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I think we have our, um, our ice cream truck. Uh, yeah. So I'm not good at drawing as those at the Seattle Aquarium may remember, but I am. Um, but so we didn't. I have some notes, but we didn't really expand on our on our picture. But again, so we were the ice cream truck and looking at that phases of the multi-sensory experience. Um, we didn't settle on a tune, Jim, um, but we were thinking maybe that it starts with like that ice cream song kind of tinkling and then maybe it morphs into some sort of marine sound, um, whether it's ocean waves or the, the animal noises, or maybe it's the... Salish Sea takes care of me soundtrack. I don't know. Um, anyway, and then so in, to try to get into um, the empathy practices, we were thinking like maybe to get at the framing, you sort of rather than having it just be a focus on um, like a school of fish or whatever, that it really would focus on the experiences of one animal. <clears throat> so you could kind of then frame it with some of those, you know, pronouns and name, that kind of thing. Um, we felt like the going through that multi-sensory experience was very much like taps into that imagination and experience. Um, but um, like the idea of focusing on the individual, but in relation to others, um, so that experience of like the symbiotic relationships of what animals um, or parts of the environment help um, each other, but also how can they protect, you know, how can a, the mom protect her, um, her baby fish or, or what have you. Um, knowledge, we thought that that depending on what animal um, you kind of are going through that experience with that you could incorporate the the knowledge components of um, you know what are the you know does it is it at night time that the the animal is is feeding or or um, you know does it like to live in a cave that kind of thing um, so you could pull that in depending on what animal <clears throat> you were focusing on um, we also liked the idea of you know kind of the web of life of maybe um, maybe there's something like this is what the the animal needs, but then oh you know when the changing temperatures how does that impact its its environment? Um, so there may be kind of things that then kind of are taken away from that experience. Um, but you know to avoid getting focused on too much negative, also having that be at kind of the endpoint of. What's the conservation action you can take to help put back the elements that were um, were going to be threatened? So, so that you could end on that positive note and something that like, wow, I really want to stop using single use plastics because you know I've seen what that can do. Um, and um, also this um, some ideas about. I think one of the other workshops had a um, kind of an infinity puzzle. And so we were thinking maybe on the, the, the metal on the side of the truck could be, there could be, um, you know, the puzzles of, of 
what is a home and what is safety and food and and kind of building different models of what that could look like. Um, and so you could see the different viewpoints of either different animals and different people going through the exhibit to see, to learn some about the, um, about that, you know, different experiences. Also like what does a missing piece, if there's a piece that you can't have for the idea of food, like is that, how does that um, impact things? Um, and then, yeah, so maybe there's some questions of getting at the practice piece of like, what is the, what is a home? What is safety? What is food? So you're getting the people going through to think about um, what home means for different people, different animals, um, and really kind of getting through that experiencing and practicing of seeing themselves in that um, animal. And the modeling, that was a little bit tougher, but perhaps, you know, as the parents or adult caregivers are going through and experiencing it, then they can um, be encouraged to tie that back um, later on. Yeah, I like all the connections that you're talking about between the, the person who's participating in the experience and the animals, because I think that's like there's one there's one thing about taking that like trying to put yourself in the animal's shoes, but it's also another thing just to sort of feel like a resonance or or a connection or or a, you know like a harmony with the animal and like that that animal has a home, I have a home, or or maybe I maybe I don't have a home and you know the the animal does or the animal is displaced like I'm feeling displaced. So I I think that there's some like like those kind of resonances could be really powerful. And I and, and uh, I'm thinking when we think broadly about about all of these like what in the end it's you know is it going to look like a, a food truck or an ice cream truck or or a, you know or a, a parade float or whatever it might be might it might not I, I think all of these things have sort of interesting pieces of the puzzle I love the idea of thinking about what success looks like and like the idea that a truck would be moving through a neighborhood and people would be like, oh my God, it's the empathy truck and go running for it. That feels like success, right? The empathy, the chance to practice empathy would be ex an exciting treat for somebody. I think that feels like success. When we think, when you, so you've been through a couple of design iterations, you've heard some, some of our ideas of what we think about with empathy, you've had a chance to share conversations with each other about, about your ideas about empathy. What are some of the, the sort of larger scale ideas that have risen to the top for you, or maybe some ideas from, from your conversations didn't quite make it into the design that would have been really good in another design. Love to hear people's thoughts after, after spending a few hours iterating on the idea. Yeah, Elif, please. Um, thanks, Jim. Um, and, um... Well, this might be a little dark, but <laughs> I was thinking, you know, uh, I mean, one of the challenges that I see um, in, in, in empathy and our you know, ability to connect with each other uh, is also closely related to how we see ourselves as part of something greater than uh, ourselves, the, the mm -hmm. whole. And, uh, and often, you know, we like to build things, we like to like, show things, make things whole, and then present it as like, you know, happy and done. And, you know, you feel good. You feel like you have accomplished something. Everything is in order. But empathy sometimes requires vulnerability. And, and this requires sometimes, you know, putting a person in a, a real life uh, sort of uh, challenge, you know, the dilemma that they need to solve on the spot. Uh, and um, so, you know, like, let's say, you know, there's a, imagine you know, all the creatures, you know, that maybe there could be like some threads in each of the, but, but you know, uh, experiences that sort of repeat as the, like the overarching theme of this like wholeness one, like not the whole thing is about that, but eventually uh, you sort of idea, uh, maybe having a, like a larger biodiversity library of these, you know, and it could look like a puzzle, but then there can be an experience that 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 puzzle is somehow destroyed, you know, being destroyed. And I don't know how to do that, you know, but uh, like if, if there was a way to show and like create some anxiety in the in the uh, 
the visitor that you know something that they've created or they were looking at is just sort of like getting pixelated and going away and um not not to traumatize you right. know I don't, I don't want to traumatize anybody but that that's the reality mm -hmm. that that's what's happening so i think it is important to sort of like um introduce that idea that this this is really very real and and what was it, like the biodiversity reporting that uh, uh, that they sent out the species that are on red list i mm -hmm. think that yeah. i mean this is happening now and you know i think it would be good to just be realistic and you know and and show maybe you know like how how that uh you know species you know removal from that hole the picture affects me uh as if as if i am the one you know right uh and 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 it could be you know one of the ways that i really like this um I think Philip Cousteau said this at one point that you know like it's just like the he imagined that you know all the species were like a beautiful beautiful books you know that are in a library and you're just picking out one book and burning it and it's like a so something more yeah. emotional I don't know <laughs> right well I think it, we there's definitely a problem to solve right so we're not pretending there isn't a problem to solve and so so is there it's a it's a it's a delicate balance right because you, you we we know just from the the conservation psychology of it that people seem to respond well to stories of hope and potential um more so than sort of doom and gloom and i know that's not what you're suggesting but the but like there there does have to be some tension right like that a story of of hope and recovery comes from some place it comes from a sense of loss it comes from um you know, a sense of, of rejuvenation. So I, I think there, there's something there to, to, to pick at for sure. We have to be very and, careful and, with it, I think. Yeah. Because, because, you know, there's, if you tap into personal distress and you make it a stressful um, experience, and even if it's only part of it, you know, that stress as a motivator does something else than the empathy as a motivator. So you think, I think mm -hmm. without, because that's what we do, we're doing with the plastic, right? You are the plastic, you go through the whole, but in the end of that, we feel guilt, we feel shame, you know, there's, a, and, and that motivates to do something, but does it motivate on the long run to really tap into the experience of the other worlds that we are not? I'm not sure. I did some research into this and personal distress, it's, it's a difficult motivator. It yeah. certainly depends on, on the sort of age and developmental level of your of your audience as well right so it's um younger kids they they internalize those those broader those broader distresses very personally uh and and it can sort of interfere with their developing a sense of wonder about nature and the natural world and but it don't you know, if you've got if you've got older kids if you've got adults um you know even the wash to shore exhibit right it's it there's there is some, there is a tension there. You know, this is, this is beautiful, but it's all from, it's all kind of, it, there is some darkness in there as well. So yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely a delicate balance. I think a big part of that, really, is, I really, oh. sorry, is, is having a, um, an outlet, right? I, I think that is, we've talked about that a lot with the empathy work that mm -hmm. you can't load people up with all this empathy and then send them out into the world, right? Like that, Carol Saunders talks about how that creates a boomerang effect where people just get real self, you know, they say like, well, there's nothing I can do about it. I might as well live my life while I have it because nothing I do matters, right? And so you don't want to get into that moral disengagement space. So whatever it is, if you are ever going to venture into that territory needs to have right the the outlet um the the empathy funnel that you can use to direct your your emotions and we 100 percent want that outlet right because that's the idea the transformation is from somebody who's not doing anything to somebody who wants to do something who wants to step into a space and, and take an action and with the with the inflatable colon is to it's to take take a you know to sign up for a screening um, and that's a personal benefit. And I think that's part of the part of the secret sauce there is to help people see that saving an animal or saving a habitat isn't just a selfless act. It's not altruism. It's a selfish act at the same time. It's you save these animals, you save these habitats, you're saving yourself because all of these things fit together in this ecosystem. And, 
And so the, 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 there's personal tangible benefits that a person can derive from a diverse and, and thriving ecosystem. How do we bring out those sort of personal, that personal relevance, which I think as, as another thing that you had mentioned, Ella, that personal relevance, I think that's, that's really important to getting people to, to do something. Um, and when you talk about personal relevance, you know, I think, I don't know, just wanted to share this quickly. Uh, it may be useful to mention, you know, like uh, these species that are getting lost or, you know, the environments that we are not caring, that they have not even been fully researched and they might actually hold the, the uh, cure for some future mm -hmm. pandemic that is yet, yet to come, you know, yet we are burning, you know, what nature has created for us potentially in balance to something else that is within that whole. Uh, so maybe like curing, it's, it could be mm -hmm. like a healing effect of the environment could be useful to introduce. Makes me think a little bit of some of the work uh, Maria Ohala um, has worked on this idea of constructive hope and what the what what it means and i know sometimes you know there's a lot of work around like climate optimism but i think you know jim to that point about um wanting to engender hope and a sense of of agency like i can do this i know what to do i feel like i can take meaningful action on a scale that's within reach for me um you know two of the the factors that um are kind of precursors to this idea of constructive hope or one of them is that self-efficacy that idea of like I've got an idea of what's going on and I know something I could do. And then the, another one is a reassurance that there are others who are also taking action. There's a sense of connectedness to collective action. And I think that's really powerful that it's, it because it isn't going to be individual action that, that, that swings the pendulum on this. Yeah. Right. And Dave mentions role modeling. And I think for those practices, it's it's not just caregivers modeling for children, but it's respected peers or um, social norms um, mm -hmm. who are who can also model and inspire. Um, and then I had two other thoughts that were triggered by some of the amazing yeah. things that folks um, had said when Elif was talking about an awareness of the problem it made me think about an escape room <laughs> and the <laughs> idea of like a playful or, or somewhat like somewhat gamified threat could be potentially interesting and a little bit um, could sort of um, defang mm -hmm. um, the harshness of that. And then the other one was, I just, I had the privilege of attending a workshop with the um, the Children's, Children's Museum of Pittsburgh and they're talking about um, XOXO, an exhibit that's all about exploring love and forgiveness. And I was really moved by one of the essential questions, one of the framing questions that inhabits the exhibit uh, throughout it, which is, um, when has someone been kind to you? And that, Elif, when you were talking about being vulnerable and engaging in empathy requires perhaps a degree of vulnerability, that question of when has someone shown you kindness is something that I think can really help to bring people into that space, really beautiful. Yeah. When has someone uh, showed care for you? You know, when has someone cared for you? I think those are, those, yeah, I think that's amazing. Our good friends at the Coral Triangle Center in Bali have an escape room with a, with a plastic theme. Um, and it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's fun. Um, and it does that the gamification does seem to take the edge off it a little bit. Well, we're, as we're nearing the end of our time together, I just want to thank you all for your contributions. Um, it's been it's been exciting to see so how some of these ideas have have filtered out. Um, just to let you know where we're heading from here, is you know this is not our last shred by any means. We've done a little bit of virtual work. We had hoped to to be doing more of, of the sort of in person charrettes, but you know, the world interfered. Uh, and so now we, we want to do more. We want to spend time with, with lots of different groups, gathering ideas and thoughts and, and expression. We want to spend time with our community. We want to spend time with, uh, with potential user groups. And then at the end, we, we hope to come back together again in sort of a super charrette and, and really start to pull together a prospectus, a design prospectus. So not a plan per se, but a, a prospectus on, on what we would like to see in a vehicle, how we think some of these, these practices and, and this, this motivation towards action can happen. So we're really excited by that. And then we're going to find someone to give us a bunch of money to build it, which will be awesome. 
So thank you so much. Uh, I hope you do keep track. If you can find our, on our website, uh, we'll always be on the Seattle Aquarium website. We'll always be updating this particular project. I know that we'll bring it back to this group at a future Designing for Empathy Summit to show it off. So thank you all for your contributions here throughout. Thank you to Dave and Sarah and Megan for making the workshop run really well. And of course, to Elif and Greg for providing us with the opportunity. We are going to be at and around the summit all week. So if more ideas percolate, uh, please do flag us down and share. And we look forward to interacting with you all and, and experiencing the, the summit together. So thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Jim. And uh, thank you, Sarah and Dave and Megan for um, making the, the breakout rooms happen and all of the, the engagement. Just a reminder for everybody, I did paste into the chat box a link to a brief survey. We would really appreciate your feedback on today's workshop. So take a moment to do that if you would please. Um, reminder that we do have a couple of other workshops coming up after the summit. We've got one coming up on Sunday, excuse me, Saturday, and then the following Tuesday. But the big showcase starts tomorrow with our, our three-day summit uh, starting tomorrow morning here on the East Coast. So we hope that you will join us for all or part of that. Elif, anything that you would like to say in closing? You no, know, just you know, this is this is why we are doing this. I'm so excited to be a part of the process. It really is a privilege to be in the same space with all these you know creative uh, minds and you know uh, all this knowledge and experience. Uh, and uh, well, this gives me hope. So <laughs> I'll to end on a high note. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. If anybody needs any, I hope you should have received the email uh, with the Zoom links and everything. And uh, if you haven't, uh, please reach out. Uh, I'll send another round, I think, tonight. So 